Crafts Drive presents. Oh, got to get ready. Laptop. Plant. That looks nice there. Ooh, cookies. Yo. Notebook. Microphone. Webcam. And coffee, of course. A video podcast where deaf, hard of hearing, and disabled creatives and their allies chat about experiences, best practice, and the future of the arts. The Green Room. Hello and welcome to Our Green Room, a weekly video podcast produced by the Strive Collective, a collaboration between Hot Coles Productions and the DH Ensemble. I'm Joe Sargent, my sign name is Joe, and I am one half of Hot Coles Productions. Um, I'm a woman in my 30s, I'm slim, I have long brown wavy hair with a fringe, uh, a pale complexion and big dark green eyes. Uh, today I am in my minimalist, um, let's call it dining area, with a charcoal grey wall behind me. Um, I have a lovely big cup of tea in my favourite mustard yellow mug and I've brought some treats along with me as well with some little cakes um, as you know you do in the green room. Um, and my interpreter today is the lovely Anna Kitson. Do you want to say hello, Anna, quickly? Hello. <laughs> my name is Anna. My sign name is this. So you're rolling your sleeves up one arm at a time. Um, I'm interpreting for Joe today. And I am a white woman. I'm around five foot seven and a half. The half is very important. I'm wearing a blue jumper with an orange stripe down the side and my background is bright green. Amazing. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, over the next 12 weeks, we will be chatting with some of the most exciting deaf and disabled and neurodiverse talent and industry allies here in the UK and internationally. We'll be celebrating best practice spotlighting unsung heroes and inspiring, hopefully, others to keep access and diversity front and centre in the coming months and years. We'll be publishing a new interview every Thursday at half past seven. You can find the details of where to get them all on our project website, on our YouTube channel or on our social media platforms. You can also tweet along with the conversation throughout the series using our hashtag, which is hashtag the green room underscore UK. I'll just say that again. That's hashtag the green room underscore UK. So this week, I'm very excited to um, introduce you all to our guests. We have the lovely deaf director and theatre maker and lampy, <laughs> Harry Marshall. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself, Harry, and um, also introduce, your, introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello, my name is Harry. My sign name is my right index finger going above my eyebrow and my fringe. It represents my fringe or my eyeliner when I can be bothered to wear it. I am a white woman in her 20s. I have long dark hair and a big thick fringe kind of Kate Bush reminiscent. <laughs> I am wearing a snaky skinned kind of styled shirt. Um, I have a white background with a hint of fairy lights behind me and I am drinking from a white spotty multicolored mug um, and I'm wearing a big pair of red headphones wow. over my ears um, and I'm a deaf director and I'm based in York. And I am being, um, I have my BSL interpreter, the lovely Caroline. Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Caroline. Um, my sign name is this, which is indicating a nose ring. Um, to index finger, thumb, clasped together to the left side of my nose. I am... Um, a white woman. I have dark brown, very short hair with a kind of quiffy thing at the top. Um, I'm in my early 50s. My background is 
a blue background and that's me. Amazing, thank you so much. And our second guest today is the wonderful Ali Pottinger. Hello Ali, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Joe. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Ali Pottinger. Uh, my sign name is this. So it's a long curl indicated by my index finger down from my forehead uh, because I learned sign language when I had long curly hair. Um, I'm a mixed race woman. I'm in my late 50s. Um, my hair is graying, but it's got little bits of pink and purple in it. Uh, I wear glasses. Um, I've got a grey t-shirt. Uh, I'm sitting in my spare bedroom um, and there's a window on my left hand side um, and in the background you can see some pictures and some bits and pieces on some shelves um, and a, a bed with a, a grey cover on it as well. Um, what else? I've got some headphones on with a mic. Uh, yep, so that's me. Very nice to be here. And interpreting for me is lovely Ian Hodgetts. Hi there, um, I, I'm Ian Hodgett and my sign name is, is this, which basically is the sign for Scotland, which is like doing the bagpipe action down your side, but the, my little finger sticks up, which is actually the American eye, so put them together and that's me, Ian. Uh, I have a blue background, uh, a blue background behind me, uh, I'm a white male and uh, I have a sort of an iconic beard, uh, which is a bit similar to Wolverine. Uh, there's lots of jokes about that in the deaf community here in Scotland. Uh, I'm wearing a black, I've got a black top on with buttons going up and uh, I've got short, short hair and it's a little bit, little bit messy on the top uh, and my eyes match my background. Thank you. Amazing. So um, the green room has been set up so that we can, you know, chat about industry things and um, just basically have an an informal chat like we would for anyone who doesn't know what a green room is um a green room you can find a green room in every single theater and it's a place where all of the artists involved in shows can go um, whether it be technicians directors actors everyone can go at the you know before show in between shows after shows and just sit have a cup of tea have a chin wag and um you know put put the words to rights um so it's really lovely while the theatres are closed that we're able to do this and, you know, get some amazing people in. And I'm really excited today because we have um, we have some backstage people as well, um, as Ali is a stage manager and Harry is a director, but she's also um, worked as a lighting operator. Is that right, Harry? Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your, you know, um, what you do as as an artist and a bit about yourself really um yeah um so i guess i've been in the i suppose part of the industry since i was 16 where my mum decided that it was a really good idea to put me in um a drama club at my local theater which i initially didn't want to do uh because i was very shy um because my sister did ballet and all of that and i tried doing street dance once and it was terrible like we blanked that bit out um oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah um anyway like um yeah i just always wanted to kind of direct after that because i realized i didn't have the kind of knack to be on stage just because it scared the hell out of me um and yeah so i trained to be a uh workshop facilitator uh originally um so i did a, a little internship uh for that um, and then I realised I was quite good at bossing people around. So um, I was put as a stage manager for a bit. <laughs> and then I saw the Lampies doing their stuff and I thought, that looks really cool. Can I have a go? Um, and yeah, I got trained in doing that. So the Lampy stuff kind of became my bread and butter. Um, and I, I've just learned the craft by doing. Um, so now I can operate and programme, but initially I couldn't. I could just rig things. Um, and yeah, like I do, I used to do that before um, the pandemic um, and then while directing. So I just thought it was a good thing to have a lot of hats and a lot of trades as a director. It means I could just jump into any role. So, yeah, that, that's, what, that's me. I think that everyone, um, you know, a lot of people in the industry have lots of different skills and um, that, you know, that makes to much more rounded theatre makers in the end, um, being able to work in different areas. Um, I myself am a performer 
um, writer and um, designer. And I do a lot of design for other people as well as a freelancer. Um, so, but um, when we were chatting the other day, it was really um, interesting when you, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get my questions up. That's just my little reminders. Um, yeah, so like Claire, and to a degree myself as well, um, from Hot Coals, you, um, so you actually hid at the beginning of your career, you hid the fact that you were actually deaf because you were concerned that it might, um, it might harm your chances or, or, or affect, you know, your ability to get work if people knew that you were deaf. Um, but then you, you did a few um, amazing courses, which, um, for example, you were part, you went up to Manchester to do the deaf directors, um, was it the Regional Theatre Young Directors Scheme, is that right? <laughs> That's right, it's such a <laughs> nice about that and how that changed things for you, that would be amazing. Yeah, um, so I did hide it at first, just partly uh, when I was diagnosed, um, it was uh, basically a teacher kind of, a, you know, you're the daydreamer, aren't you, when you're the deaf kid in school, um, and I just was zoning out in my classes. Um, and she kind of just accused me, like, just there and then going, are you deaf? And I was just like, I don't know, I'm like six or seven, like, <laughs> like I don't know. And then she had a word with my mum, and I thought that meant I was in trouble, um, because she had a word with my mum, and then I was hoiked off to the doctors, and they used that weird tuning fork. And I had no idea what it meant to use that tuning fork. They just pushed it against my head, and he was like, there's something wrong. And like I remember walking back with her and I was just I was like in tears and I was like is something wrong with me mum and she was like well I don't know and so it always felt like from that point it wasn't a good thing um and then like when I went to school like I had these little cards that I could use to communicate when I didn't hear something but because I didn't blend in um a lot of my friends or a few people would throw around saying that I was making it up because I could work so well in a classroom. Um, and they just kind of took for granted that the fact when I couldn't hear, they thought I was lying. And you know, that ruse that deaf people do for attention. Um, so yeah, I just did, I did hide it. Um, and it was only until I saw that, you know, um, the regional director scheme was doing that. And I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna say and, and explore this pathway that I've never really explored. So I went up to Manchester, I didn't know anybody. Um, like I only knew Sue um, who, who runs it and she was just so lovely. And then I met, um, you know, Brian Duffy, Sophie Stone, um, Ace and Louis, and they just opened up like my entire world to like deaf culture and deaf community and they like really embraced me into it like I didn't know any sign like I didn't know how to communicate with Duffy or Ace but they really tried with me and yeah it just kind of stuck and I was like you know when you you kind of there and you're like oh I found my people like I don't really know where I fit into it but I found my people um so ever since that point I've kind of wanted to be an advocate and I've wanted to be like proactive in it rather than hiding it now and it's kind of you know it's been a really nice journey so far I don't know if it's been the same for other people yeah I think I mean that's that's an amazing story in the fact that you found you know it it does feel like that doesn't it you find your people and a lot of people don't even know that these courses are even available to them which um you know it, it it's great that it's becoming more 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 people are doing courses I know that you or, or um, opportunities you're currently working with Grey Eye for example and mm -hmm the more we talk about and are open about these opportunities, um, people can come out their shells and, and discover their people. Um, I know that um, Claire won't mind me talking about when we started at RADA together, she'd, she went deaf, um, she first lost her hearing when she was nine in one ear and then lost the hearing in her other ear when she was 14. And she hid the fact that she was deaf until she was you know, nearly 30, I think she was 29 at RADA when we started on the MA Theatre Lab. So sorry, my phone is currently ringing, which means that I <laughs> have lost you for a second. I'm going, so sorry, <laughs> did you lose me? Um, so yes, I'll go back to what I was saying about Claire. She um, she lost her hair when she was nine in her left ear and then, um, then lost the rest of her hair when she was 14. And um, she, when we started at Raza when she was 29, I'm so sorry, my dog is scratching very loudly upstairs. Um, she, um, um, 
yeah so she we started at raja and there was another deaf girl in our class and claire had never been open about the fact that she was deaf beforehand and she kind of just did this moment of you know we're introducing ourselves and she goes hello i'm claire and i'm deaf too you know it was it was brilliant and it opened up her world she um me and her came together to make work i'm dyspraxic and um i i've only just started to be more open about that because i've kind of always felt that people just dis consider dyslexia and dyspraxia to be a sort of you know it's not a real disability so i kind of sort of you know hid it to myself and now i'm more open about it and my goodness it just it builds your confidence so much to find your people which which i guess is what we we both have done um and it, it's it's brilliant and through that um a whole world of theater that is just really exciting so i'm going to just slide back to my questions so i've got to have my lift next to me um so yes and um it's also created new ways of working and um, I discovered that I could work backstage, which I found really exciting from a designer point of view, um, which leads me over to Ali. Ali, I would love to hear about your story. So you started off as a stage manager and then became an interpreter. Do you want to tell us about that? That would be great to hear about. Yeah, so um, I uh, I trained at um, Rose Bruford College uh, in the late 80s. <clears throat> And uh, I left as uh, trained as a stage manager. Um, I worked at um, the Theatre Royal Stratford East. Um, that was my first job, and it was great because it meant I I met so many amazing people there, who some of whom I still work with today. So it was a great training ground. Um, and I was there for a, a couple of years, and then was a freelance stage manager for a number of years. And uh, I started thinking, oh, I'd, I'd kind of like to do something else. And this was sort of, I suppose, getting on for mid to late 90s. Um, and I was working on a production where we had um, uh, an interpreted performance. And it was a woman called Sherry Eugene who is from Bristol. Um, uh, I believe that she um, is from a deaf family and she was a bit of a celebrity in Bristol. Uh, uh, she, uh, because she was a TV newsreader as well, but she worked as an interpreter, um, uh, um, a black woman. And she came up so that, yes, yeah, sorry, the theatre company that I was working with was Talawa Theatre Company. And Talawa Theatre Company is a, a black theatre company. It's still going to this day. Um, and uh, so we had a black interpreter, appropriate, yeah. culturally appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw the um, Sherry working and I went, wow, that's really interesting. And so it took me on a journey to learning sign language. Um, I sort of took a sideways step and did some admin work, theatre admin work, which meant because that was more nine to five, I could do evening classes and learn, start to learn sign language. Um, and then uh, I got another stage management job uh, working at the Tricycle Theatre, as it, it was then called. It's now the Kiln. Uh, and that was a show called The Little Violin. And the, there was a deaf performer in it, Neil Fox, Neil Fox Roberts, as he is now. Yeah. Uh, and I saw interpreters working with Neil in the rehearsal room. And I thought, oh, right. I think that's what I'd like to do, because as a stage manager, my favourite job is being deputy stage man manager, which means that I'm in the rehearsal room most of the time. And that's my favourite place to be is in the rehearsal room. I love it. I'm in another virtual rehearsal room at the moment. And it just reminds me how much I love it. Uh, so, yeah, so that was kind of my journey in. And then I went to Bristol Uni. Um, I did the deaf studies degree there uh, and graduated in 2002. Um, and uh, yeah, it just sort of went from there. I met some great people um, at Shape uh, Disability Arts. I met people like John Wilson. Uh, I met uh, Jenny Seeley and all the gang at Grey Eye. And so I've just been very lucky with the contacts that I've made. Um, but that's sort of, and then that's also led me into combining the two in, in the sense of being a stage manager for shows where there are deaf and disabled people 
uh, backstage, on stage, whatever, directing. Um, I don't actually, though, interpret at the same time as being a stage manager. <laughs> No, I that think is, that would be that'd be a bit much to yeah. ask, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Too much. Can't do that. But yes, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded way. But that was yes, that's how I got into it, was just watching an interpreted performance. I think also, um, because I am slightly older, <laughs> I remembered Vision On, uh, which was a children's program from the 60s, uh, mm -hmm. with a woman called Pat Kiesel, who I think she was a teacher of the deaf and she was a theatre maker. Um, and she uh, she she used sign language on telly, and this was in the 60s. And I remember watching it as a child. So I think it had always been somewhere in the back of my mind. Mm. That's amazing. So I mean, it's it it's so rare to come across a stage manager who also signs. I know that, um, or, or anyone back of house that um, back of house. I keep saying back of house instead of backstage. <laughs> anyone backstage who who does sign as well um i know that we've um we've worked with a um, lighting designer and stage manager before um who we met through dh ensemble um rachel sampley who's got a, who's got a little bit of sign language i think she's got level one and a study level two and we've just put our for uh, one of our stage managers at hot calls we've just um signed her up to do level one bsl at city lit so um, it felt so good to be able to do that because I know she's so passionately wanted to um, be able to communicate and she's become really passionate about. I think that's what it is about the, the type of theatre, accessible theatre. Um, I don't know how you feel, but I feel it's just so exciting to watch and be involved in um, that it kind of, get, you know, puts its claws in. Um, yes. yeah. And yeah. I feel like it's, it's kind of overlooked a little bit when it comes to um, education, I suppose, when the people are in their training. Um, so we've just recently, um, just going back to my, my little notes again, so sorry, I keep having to, I should have highlighted these a lot better for myself. <laughs> um, so yes, we, we've been talking a lot about um, um, I'm so sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. She's going bananas. <laughs> Don't normally have dogs in the green rooms. So sorry. Um, so yeah, we've recently been having a lot of conversations um, around graduates finishing their training, whether it be performers or, or technicians, etc. And um, they're encountering deaf and disabled artists out in the industry for the first time, and it is a throws them or it overwhelms them and they can find it really difficult to cope and it can become very unhelpful experience for both artists um, and we feel like if young actors, directors, technicians etc um, were exposed to deaf and disabled artists at an earlier stage in their training it would be less overwhelming. Um, yeah. I mean what are your thoughts on that? I mean yeah, no, totally. I um, I also I teach at Rose Bruford, which is where I trained. Uh, and so, you know, teaching the next generation, hopefully, of stage managers and uh, technicians. And uh, what's really interesting, I think you're right. We last year, when was it last year? Yes, just a year ago, in fact, um, I took um, the first year technical theatre students from Rose Bruford to see a production um, by Baz Productions, um, which uh, sadly Baz uh, is, is not a company anymore and the theatre venue is it, very, very sad. Uh, the theatre venue, the bunker um, in South London near London Bridge is also sadly not a venue anymore. It's really sad. But what we did was produce a brilliant piece of theatre called The Process. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, and it was fantastic. And I took all my students to see it. I was actually stage managing that show, um, but I took the students to see it and they absolutely loved it. They loved everything about it. They loved seeing sign language on stage. They loved uh, what the play had to say. Um, and so they were blown away by it. And several of them wanted to learn sign language after that. They really, you know, and, and they did get that, yes, that they may meet deaf and disabled people in um in in their working life in their in their professional practice um i think that 
I would say that younger students now or students today are much more aware of those things. They're much better at naming things. You know, it was interesting hearing um, the story um, about Claire and Harry's story about hiding it and not wanting to say. But I think students today are much better about doing that in many instances. Uh, um, they're, they're much more open and forthright in saying, no, actually, I, you know, um, I have a disability or um, I have a, a mental health issue or whatever it is. And so I think they're more receptive. So I agree with you, Joe. I think it's getting in there um, early uh, with all these things. And I, I do a, a session on um, community and diversity um, with the students. Um, so I talk about things like that and also about people fighting to want to be heard and, you know, people are not going to stand for just being in the background anymore. But yes, mm -hmm. totally. I think, I think, and I think also it, it should go over into the, the acting side as well, or the acting courses that, um, they, that the, they may have deaf and disabled colleagues yeah, um, and yeah, the opportunities to get into, I mean, I mean, we're talking about it yesterday, Harry, about normalising and therefore, you know, having um, children go in, you know, children at school, it, it becoming more normal to have deaf, disabled and, and children educated to, um, oh, what was it you were saying, Harry? I've forgotten, you, you, you'll probably um, articulate it better than me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we got into a really nice discussion about about when um, people should start talking or being exposed or just having a bigger awareness of, um, you know, deaf and disability and just differences. Um, and I was saying it shouldn't start um, in university level. It should start right back in primary school to the point where if that like because I always felt like a lot of teachers are kind of rabbit in the headlights with it and I feel like that's not their fault at all it's just because there's not enough training or education on that but even a simple you know you know a good morning can make so much of a difference to like someone who is deaf or who does need to communicate a different way and I think if that's implemented in a classroom earlier on people are more accepting later on um like um one of my other jobs when I first came to York you know when you do your hodgepodge jobs um was that I worked at a um, referral unit and I was trained as a um, Senko TA um, and that eventually led to me um, helping young people integrate into mainstream secondary school and their SEN hubs now are 10 times better than what any of us had you know five years ago it's like dramatically changed and it's really nice to see um, and those children and are being exposed to that and, and like having those kids being integrated back into their classrooms that like other young people just accept that now and they're a lot more kinder and they're a lot more aware about what their fellow classmates need especially at the referral unit they're not always kind if they come across something and they and you know they lose their patience if you have to keep repeating things to them or if they don't understand things a certain way but they're a lot more open to wanting to connect with each other than what I saw when I was at school um because I was I think I was laughing about it with you saying that um if you were a special needs kid you were kind of hoiked out of your classrooms yeah. I was like saying we would put like there was three deaf including myself at my school there were three um of us and I remember being hoiked out and shoved on a school trip because we were deaf like why what did this do to enrich our education I don't know but apparently going to go eight was really helpful and learning to shoot a rifle like meant that we bonded more I don't know but like I just remember going why am I here why am I not in class and like I don't know and I think like going on from that if it's more normalized in, in earlier school I think the confidence of students will Will, Im will improve um, as they get older and they'll see more opportunities to them. But also drama schools and everyone, um, it is improving. Drama schools are, are offering more places to, um, to deaf and disabled students. I know, for example, on my course at RADA, we had two deaf students in our class. And um, I know that drama schools are trying to do better, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, it, it's um those opportunities need to be available to deaf and disabled artists um so that the, the the playing field is leveled out you know because you're going out and you're meeting people in the industry and if they don't have the opportunity to train um you know there is as i said an unlevel playing field so um yeah and 
Um, it also means that with representation, um, it means that there's a lower level of representation within the industry, which is a big subject right now and a big topic. Um, and um, it means people and society don't get a represented, like they don't get characters on screen or on stage which represent them. They don't get to see themselves on stage. It's the same, you know, with um, opportunities with, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter move. You don't see enough black characters on, on screen. And that's, that's, it's the same with disabilities as well. You don't get to see people with different disabilities. Um, for example, like I've got some statistics here. Um, this is theater statistics from 2019. Um, so we only had 20% of UK theaters providing, 20% providing audio description, 21% BSL, 19% providing captioning, and um, we're looking at others, you've also got 4% dementia friendly performances and 20% relaxed performances. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty dire. <laughs> um, and what percentage for relaxed performances, Jo? And 20%. Yeah, and that's it. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Both of you. <laughs> mm, I'm surprised by the um i'm surprised by the captions being so low to be honest with you um i would have thought that that would have caught up um i'm sort of sadly not surprised by the other statistics but the captioning one i i do think that's quite surprising um and uh yeah i mean i think it's uh yeah, I think it's I think it's partly laziness. I think people, you know, it's uh, it, because it's so easy to do these days. You know, the 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 research and development thing that I'm doing at the moment, um, I'm working with someone who um, has just learned as they've gone along, and they do creative captioning. Um, uh, Stephen Lloyd and he, he, it's just you know he knows how to do it because he's learned how to do it but also it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to it, it's also a, a create it, the the clue is in the title it's creative captioning so I think it's about having that ex, uh, creative access and that if people view it as a creative thing uh, then maybe they'll be more inclined to do it. I think maybe it's the, you know what I mean, it's seeing the potential for it. So the more you can get that out there, I think maybe people will be more inclined because it's, and I'm not dissing stage text, so please don't get me wrong. Yes. It, no, no. Uh, but that it it's, it doesn't have to be a box with pixels going through it. It can be something else. Um, yeah. There's there, but it's what's appropriate. Let me say that that's what it should be. It's what's appropriate. Yeah. So if stage text is appropriate for one thing, but creative captions might be appropriate for another. So it's a, I think it's about that as well. Absolutely. We I mean as um, I we always say with our shows we want the access to di to dictate. Also we the show will. Sorry, really, literally. We use the access, um, depending on what show we're doing, depends what kind of access we're going to use. So we might use creative captioning. Um, we might use visual, because we specialize more in visual theater um, with Hot Calls. So, you know, um, visual storytelling, for example. Um, we might use a mixture of BSL English VV, for example. But there's so many interesting ways we can. Um, we can experiment with captions now. I find captions hugely exciting. I've used them in all sorts of different ways. And Harry, you've just recently done a project um, which was called Park Bench, was it? Do you want yeah. to say about that? Yeah, that's right. Well remembered. Um, so I wasn't um, necessarily any like a creative on it. I were, came on as a production assistant just because uh, it was York's first kind of outdoor um show um in like as the pandemic was kind of hitting in the summer um a group of us really wanted to do some theater for everybody um and um at the first meeting um i pointed out it's not for everybody if you don't have access um so i suggested the difference engine as a means of providing captions um outdoors um like unfortunately really frustratingly we didn't get our marketing out in time which i which is why i feel um, not surprised when you say the statistics about the captioning, because I feel like that's where the kind of issue is um, in a lot of situations where 
theatres just aren't transparent about when there's you know access available in their shows so most people who need it kind of just accept that it's not there so they're not going to keep bothering to check because I know I wouldn't if someone was like well I'm not providing it and it's like well if you're not providing it I'm not going to keep seeing whether you, whether that's happening you know a couple of months later um, unless you tell me um, so I feel like just the lack of awareness and the kind of miscommunication is sometimes the biggest issue with that but yeah we, we did have them and I was really happy that we did have them even if nobody turned up the fact that we provided that service and it was available in case you know someone wandered by and they saw oh there's captions oh I can just buy a ticket right on the door and come in and there's captions and it's not and we didn't necessarily have them on set days you know the famous Thursday matinees you know <laughs> like apparently where every deaf person or person who needs captions comes out is a Thursday matinee but um like we had them on other random days which was just nice to have that kind of you know, fluidity of 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 just having them there but I'm not surprised like I'm um, like no tea or shade to any venues in the area but I've just come across several issues with captionings where um I booked to see some live theatre it was that unfortunately it never went ahead because you know lockdown two hit um but I needed to go and see a show with the captions and I messaged them saying where's the best place to sit um and they said we don't know we haven't figured out where we're putting them and I was just like so I'm going to turn up and assume that they're somewhere in this vicinity and I might have to move. But also in the act of moving, you might not have the seat available, but I've paid for my ticket. And I was just like, OK, well, we'll just roll with this. Um, and then another one recently where we were asked to provide access needs and I turn up and they weren't provided for. And I just said, but you asked for us twice to verify this like and I said I needed captions and you went cool and then I asked where are the captions and you went oh yeah we're going to add them on later like we've recorded this you can watch it later and I was like no but I want to be involved now and you you asked for them so provide them like it's not hard yeah. so like I'm not surprised when you come out with those stats like I'm just not surprised it it it, it I was quite shocked because I I've always thought that um captions were same as you Ali I thought captions were more um, were, were used more and in fact BSL seems to have a higher percentage than captions um, but hopefully things are starting to shift in the right direction especially now um, you know this is a silly well it's not a silly thing it's a great thing um, but for example um, TikTok and I know it's not a theatre or anything like that but TikTok you now can't actually get high on the algorithm if you don't caption your videos so it's starting to influence the um you know the younger generation because it's more of a younger generation facility i mean you know it's more wide now since lockdowns but it is you know you know that sort of influence is really great because it's going to start to push people to just having captions and as i always say i would love captions to be normalized mm. going back to bsl um ali you worked on something which I am so excited to hear about. Um, I'm just going to remind myself what it's called. It's called Theatre Technical BSL. Yes. This amazing, well, tell us about it. I was uh, so excited reading up on it and slightly shocked mm. that I didn't know about it earlier. <laughs> well, that's probably down to me not publicising it well enough. But anyway, more about that later. Um, <laughs> It yet so going back slightly to education. No, it's two things. Sorry, sorry, Ian, I'm messing you about here. Um, so first thing was that I was working on um, a tech a tech rehearsal for something, and I think it was with David Ellington was there. David Ellington was the actor. I'm working in a technical rehearsal, and uh, I'm trying to interpret these things backstage, and I'm going. I don't know what the sign is for that. I don't I, I, What is the sign for that? So I said to David, do you know what the sign is for that? He's going, no, I don't know. So this sort of like set a little thing going in my head. And I thought, huh, I wonder if it would be useful to have a glossary of technical theatre terms translated into BSL. So it was kind of a bit selfish because it was more of an interpreting tool. Um, but obviously the knock on effect would be that then the deaf person would have a better understanding of what was going on backstage in sign language. Um, then I thought, well, but where are the deaf technicians as well? So then it became something else. So then it goes back to the whole idea of education as well. So the, yeah, so technical theatre BSL 
um, I was awarded some funding by the Arts Council, which was very nice. And we did a bit of a residential. Um, this is now in 2020. Well, it was. Um, we did a resident. Oh, good Lord, yeah, it's a long time ago. Um, we did a residential uh, in um, in Bath in a school, a lovely school in Bath, because it had a theatre and I had a connection, a, a contact there. So that that was the reason. But I, I felt it was important to be in situ so that you could see some of the things that you were talking about. So you could see a lantern that you were referring to, or you could get the you know the stage right, the stage left because you were on a stage. Um, so I had a fantastic uh, team of deaf people. Um, there was Daryl Jackson, um, uh, Jean Sinclair, um, Norma McGilp, uh, Mary Jane, Russell De Clifford, Mary Jane. Um, I'm going to forget people now. Davy Taig, um, uh, Judith Jackson, uh, Stephen Webb, uh, is that everybody? I feel like I've missed somebody. So my apologies if I have, but it was a really crack deaf team and they looked at the jargon and they came up with these amazing um, translations into BSL. Uh, we had, you know, great voiceover. We had, we tried to do the whole thing. So there's captions, voiceover and the signs themselves. But also what we tried to do was to put the signs in context so that it wasn't just there's a sign for the word because it doesn't mean anything. So th th there's a story behind it sort of thing. Um, and then it was filmed by the wonderful Ted Evans and Bim Ajadi. So, you know, I, tippy top team. I was blessed, I say, blessed <laughs> to have those people um, yeah. around me. But but yeah, so that so it was a two prong thing. So it was a it was an interpreting tool, but also hopefully an encouragement to people to look at technical theatre um, as a career um, because I think um, that's that's what's missing I think that's one of the missing pieces of the jigsaw is actually uh, deaf people backstage um, I think also people have expressed that they think it's a useful it's useful to have that because backstage you're supposed to be quiet so there's a there's a bonus for having sign language used backstage if you've got enough light that is <laughs> um, <laughs> by which to see but uh yeah you you know so so that's that's technical theatre bsl yeah i mean it's it's an incredible tool and you're right it's to encourage more people and i know that um definitely theatre have done some some courses to encourage deaf artists mm. into different areas of theatre with it technical design all sorts um and you know that's a real shift in the right direction but this glossary just um when i saw it and was looking through it i was like this is brilliant this is such a useful tool and it excites me um that it that it's available so um you know we will actually add a link to that um to oh, our podcast you. so that you guys you know anyone out there who wants to find it you can find it on our page um so that you can you know make use of it and um but also i mean you belong to um what was it and get my notes again oh, um yeah. you belong to stage site stage site that's site? the yeah. one yeah, could you I tell do. us a little bit about that because that's again that's another that's another great facility from yeah um stage site is fantastic um stage site was set up by um a woman called prema meta that's p r e m a uh meta is m e h t a and prema is a lighting designer uh she's a woman she's of asian origin uh british and uh she is really passionate about um diversifying the workforce backstage and that's diversifying in many many ways so it's not just about um, disability or deafness or uh, race it's also about class uh, gender it's the whole thing um, and it feels like a really positive um, group of people very very positive and what stage site aims to do is look at case studies to do actual so it's you know it's less talking and more walking is what I would say. So, so when we have fora, when we get together, it's always based around a case study. So somebody has to bring an example. 
you know it's not just like oh wouldn't it be lovely if we had more of this kind of person oh wouldn't that that'd be lovely wouldn't it yeah but how are you going to do it what have you done to make that a reality um so so that's that's a uh, that stage site it's yeah it's fantastic and you can be an individual member but also you can be a company member so maybe hot coals dh you know would consider um getting involved with stage site um but yeah my hat's off to prema and i i also think it's really indicative of um movements now you know as i say i'm in my late 50s i am going to be 60 this year and so i've seen a lot uh, in terms of diversity and campaigns for diversity and all of this sort of thing and what i think now is that people are much more aware of it's much broader when people talk about diversity and also that you talk about allies i think there's a great many more people working in allyship so you know it's it's impressive to me i think when i hear people you know um th there was a an organization called um act for change act for change yeah that's right acting for Ch act for change which was set up um by um a man called danny lee winter and uh, he he also he included so it was about diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, but he also included um, disability in that. So that that's what I mean to say is I think there's a lot more allyship going on. So it's not just people in their silos. So people are saying, well, if that person isn't represented, neither am I. You know, so it's a bit of an I am Spartacus moment, if you know what I mean. Uh, that's what I feel at, at the moment. It, the, these campaigns are much more all-encompassing, um, which is which is very positive. So stage site is from a backstage angle. Obviously, Act for Change was from who you see on a screen or on a stage, but uh, but stage site is who do you see backstage as well. Um, but I think that, that the, what's really encouraging about both of those movements is that they are so all-encompassing. Yeah, I mean. I, I totally agree with you with saying that more more allyship is definitely uh, happening mm. and I've seen it in my career um we started in 2012 with hot coals and um I've seen a huge shift um in the last few years to do with you know people you know the di disability arts sector let's call it um has seems to have grown and grown I know that um we're, you know, we're one of quite a few companies who started around about the same time. And when I started, the only companies we really knew about were definitely in Grey Eye. They were the two, you know, the two big guns. And, and now there's more companies, which is so exciting, doing different work and trying new things. Mm. Um, and, you know, as I said, introduced to, to work that I just think, I, I mean, I personally find accessible work. Um, a lot more interesting and uh, you know just a, a cut above the rest to be honest i mean that might be i might be being biased here but i do think um it's just um, I, when i go to a normal show now i find myself like oh, you know <laughs> i miss yeah. i miss the deaf performers because they're so um brilliantly visual to watch um and and you know they communicate on on a whole new level and i just miss i miss I suppose the the access as well because so many people do such creative things with it now mm. so now um i'm just having a quick look to see if i've covered all of the bits i wanted to cover um i suppose if you had any advice both of you if i start i'll start with harry if you had any advice to um someone who wanted uh, you know to yeah young deaf artist who was thinking about going into directing um it, have you got any bits of advice that you would pass on to them as as a as a deaf artist yourself that's a really really good question um i think a lot of it depends on the individual but um i would say again try and find your people like try and find those allies and those people who are actively supporting um like deaf artists and and just deaf individuals in general like i think what ali has done is so awesome with the glossary and like i've been lucky to find some allies at york theater royal um in terms of backstage so i just wanted to kind of go back on that 
um, where we've developed our own really basic sign for when I'm focusing or rigging and I'm up working at height. And and like my, you know, the chief LX there and his depth have just been so brilliant at trying to find methods that work because we've, you know, God knows we've had a lot of hiccups along the way of where I've accidentally dropped things on people because they I thought they said let go and they did not. Um, <laughs> um so yeah like so it's finding those allies and finding that that support and and just getting in those rooms in terms of shadowing like you know like you normally do but yeah um i'd also say like try to avoid the toxic relationship with the arts as well because that's something that's taken me a while to figure out um like i don't think it's i don't think you should knock you, you know what people call the muggle job or the side hustle i think you should be very proud of anything else that you do outside of the arts um and you shouldn't feel disparaged or discouraged if you only make one show a year and you do that through what i call dumpster diving directing where you pull it together by any means necessary but you're really proud of it um like yeah so i think own what you do every day and own your little victories and find your people that would be my advice amazing and Ali, anyone who wants to go into stage management or or interpreting? <laughs> uh, well, um, okay. Uh, for stage management, um, I just, I think it's, first of all, it's just, it's knowing that it's actually a job. Uh, I think that's one of the main battles. And I think that that's, that's one of the battles that I'm trying to fight is, is, is that people actually even know that it's a job because many, many people don't know what it is. Uh, you know, that's, that's the question that I'm asked most of all is what is stage management? So I'm not sure whether it's advice. I think it's, it's just, uh, no, maybe my advice is this, is to understand that you, if you don't want to perform, that's fine because there's other things to do, and that you can you can be involved in in um, in in theatre, in the performing arts, whatever it is. You don't have to be a performer. So I think that's my number one advice is that um, because it's a little bit similar to Harry, I I, I just uh, which is one of the reasons I don't do performance interpreting because I am not a performer, and I you know I sort of fell into stage management because I wanted to be. In involved but I didn't want to be a performer um, and I think I think that's my advice is to look at look broader you know if you're looking at a piece of theatre think about how those things those props or furniture got on stage so work out how that happened you know it was it, it didn't just there aren't little elves that sort of put them there so you know I think it's about informing yourself um, but I think it's also about realizing that performance isn't isn't it um, in in terms of interpreting, I don't know what to say. I mean, that's just a personal thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and I, but I think also, you know, that uh, what I also want to say is that perf um, performance interpreting is one thing, but also I'm very passionate about rehearsal room interpreting being a skill, and that it it, it has an ethos and a skill of its own. Um, I, and I think, you know, in the same way that performance isn't everything performance interpreting isn't everything there's other ways to be involved in interpreting yeah. in theatre yeah. yeah it's amazing how how little people know about the jobs that are available in theatre yeah. that are just I myself didn't know I was a designer until I'd already designed three shows yeah. <laughs> and then went I'm a designer because another company came up to me and said would you design our show which was the DH ensemble and then I started working for other theatre companies outside of yeah. of hot coals and um so i learned by doing as well on that front um you know trained actor but <laughs> learned by doing on the design front um and yeah a lot of people just don't know that these jobs exist and i think people um it's great for us to have a platform to be able to go out and say there's other things you can do and for companies like for example, definitely these courses offering opportunities for deaf artists to to start learning, but also mainstream drama schools um, that offer technical courses. You know, they now are much far more open um, to receiving deaf and disabled um, students. Um, I know yeah. um, I don't know about them all, but I do know that, that Rada is more open and um, openly calling out for deaf and disabled artists yeah. to apply mm. and. Um, 
you know, I can speak from a personal point of view that they're hugely supportive to us. That's, I mean, that's where I was diagnosed properly. I mean, I was diagnosed at university, at Winchester University, but then I went to RADA and I was re-diagnosed because they were like, that's not exactly what, what's yeah. wrong or wrong, I yes. should say, and gave me the most incredible support, but also they're open to conversations. We've had conversations with them about offering, you know, what they can offer postgraduates you know so we have I think the drama schools are having these conversations um to to be able to create a much more inclusive industry so hopefully that progress will continue there's still a yes. lot of work yes. to be done. yeah there is I think, yeah I think that they need to share yeah um share the work that we're making as, as an industry overall and could so, I just uh, just a final thing, Joe? Sorry, just to say, um, yeah, at um, Rosebruford College, they've got a new BA course coming up called Theatre for Social Change. So I don't know if anybody would be interested in having a look at that. Um, mm. And it's it is about it's about training people to be troublemakers. So it looks like an excellent course. Uh, so that may that may inspire some people. It's not necessarily a technical course, but it's it's um, it's to make all rounded well-rounded theatre for social change makers so that sounds amazing we'll add a link to that to our um to our website and our and our um this the episode of this i'm sure um so um i have some last quick fire questions just for a bit of fun <laughs> um, I'll go from one to the other so I'll go Harry Allison rather than make you both answer all of them <laughs> So, do, we get, do we get a buzzer that we have? To <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish we had them now. Maybe we should get them on the phone. Um, so these are just a bit of fun. Um, who inspires you most out of, it's not who as in person, but what, what and who inspires you most? Right. Harry, theatre or film? Oh, theatre. Ali, costume or set? Oh, both. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Harry, tea or coffee? Tea. Ali, cat or dog? Neither. I'm allergic. Oh no, you can't have one. <laughs> um, Harry, sea or mountains? Mountains. Yay! I'm a mountain girl, mate. Um, Ali, a classic play or a modern play? Hmm, good question. Uh, I think I might say classic, actually. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Um, Harry, stage fighting or dancing? Oh, good fight. <laughs> good fight. Oh, good fight. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and Ali, pub or restaurant? Oh, uh, pub pub yeah i miss a pub i miss a restaurant in fact um and finally just to say like do you have i'm uh, both of you do you have a favorite green room oh harry oh yeah um like it's going to be really biased but like i really miss york theater royals green room just because it's the weirdest l shape of a green room like it, it's like somebody forgot that they were supposed to have a green room and they were like oh, we'll just shove them in here um yeah no i've got a lot of fond memories of that green room just because of all the uh, weird cooking that we got up to and yeah like yeah it's just been good good memories in there yeah. It is yeah. a good green room. I remember that one. It was I liked. Good I liked parties it. Parties in there as well. I mean, yeah. what? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, do you have a favourite green room? Uh, yeah, it's going to have to be the Theatre Royal Stratford East for very, very sentimental reasons. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my favourite green room. I have to say, I think my favourite green room is for sentimental reasons too. It's the green room at Park Theatre. Um, because just because of the people I've met there, it's, it's just a little green room, you know, it's not, it's nothing fancy or anything, but I've just got really, really fond memories of um, meeting some amazing people there. So, well, thank you so much, both of you. You've been amazing. We've had some really exciting conversations. I know we've gone over, but psh, okay. <laughs> um, so um, thank you for joining us in the green room this week. And also thank you to everyone who has 
tuned in or watched on demand um for watching and listening um if you've enjoyed this conversation and you want to join in the conversation yourselves please leave a comment on our youtube channel or um, you can use the hashtag hashtag the green room underscore uk on your social media um and i will see you all next week and yeah it's great thank you ever so much ladies thank, thank you for having us thank you yes thank you thank you <laughs> guests harry marshall and ellison pottinger host joe Sargent. interpreters anna kitson caroline ryan and ian hodgetts speech to text reporter norma mckay music road trips off shane the green room a video podcast produced by strive a collective made up of the DH Ensemble and Hot Coals Productions. You can find all the videos and audio recordings of this series at www.strivecollective.org forward slash the hyphen green hyphen room. Twitter at Strive Collective with no E. Hashtag the green room underscore UK. Celebrating best practice, spotlighting unsung heroes, inspiring action. Logos for Strive, Hot Coals Productions and the DH Ensemble supported using public funding by Arts Council England.